and welcome everyone to today's Parabos webinar. Parabos is Australia's resource for the control of worms, lice, flies and ticks. And we're excited today to be talking about Spotlight on Small Brown Stomach Worm. And we will be being joined by Dr. Paul Nealon. Parabos, if you don't know, is a joint initiative of Australian Wool Innovation, Meat and Livestock Australia, the University of New England and Animal Health Australia. This webinar is being recorded. We will be having a Q&A session following today's presentation. We have Megan Rogers looking after the chat function for us today. And we would also love to hear any webinar suggestions you have through that. So if you just want to drop us a note in the chat box on webinar suggestions, we will pop them on our list as we're going forward. So today joining us, we have well, myself, Fiona MacArthur, and I am with the Parabos Extension team. We also have Megan Rogers, who is, runs up our Parabos Extension team, and Dr. Matt Playford's hopped on to help us as well today. And to sit in the background, he is our Parabos technical support here. So we'll get Paul's presentation. He can start to share his screen with us all today and why he's getting up and ready to go. I'll give you a little bit of background about Paul. Paul has his own business down there in Tassie mm -hmm. in Neilon Farm Health and he graduated from a Bachelor of Vet Science in 1983. Then went on and did a Master's in Herd Health and Production in 1986 at Melbourne Uni. He's also a member of the Australian and New Zealand College of Veterinary Scientists for Epidemiology. He's heavily involved also in the pastoral industries and has spent the last 32 years down in Tasmania in mixed farming, in mixed practice veterinary, as veterinarian, and the last 17 years as a consultant in sheep and beef health and production. His main interests do lay in health and production, but he also has love of parasites like all of us on screen today. So that is why he has come to join us for this webinar. He is one of the original contributors of the Worm Boss platform and he's the author of the Worm Boss Guides for Down in Tasmania and he's a long-standing member of the Parabos Technical Committee. So it is with great pleasure that I welcome Paul to the screen and welcome him to start today's presentation. Thanks, Paul. Great to have you here. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all exceedingly well. Um, we're looking for rain in Tasmania, so some of the people on the north coast, if you can send it to us, please do. Okay, so today we're talking about uh, brown stomach worm, depending on which book you read, it's small brown stomach worm or medium brown stomach worm. Um, and we're mostly going to be talking about cattle for a reason that I'll give you in a moment or two. Okay, so today's agenda, uh, if we got time, we'll get through all of this. Um, a little bit about the species, life cycle, how it presents, the disease and the production losses, uh, control and treatment, and then hopefully at the end, enough to talk about grazing management, which is uh, something that parasitologists are always banging on about. So why mostly cattle? Well. Quite simply because in, uh, in cattle, Ostertagia is our most pathogenic scow worm, at least in the more southern areas. So in the northern parts uh, of Australia, where there are two different um, um, species of Cooperia, they can be pretty path uh, pathogenic. But uh, Ostertagia as a standalone is, uh, cuts a path of destruction in young stock. Uh, most areas where, where cattle are run. Another difference between sheep and cattle and goats is that the cattle suffer two clinical syndromes and they're uh, radically different to each other. So we need to discuss that in some detail. Um, and I guess we'd say that for sheep and goats, it's part of a scale worm syndrome. Um, so on the whole, they're not as pathogenic as, as our black scale worm, our trichostrongolus species. Um, and where there are little or no black scow worm in the true Mediterranean climate, you can affect very good environmental control with some strategic measures. And the final thing I'd say is that there's still a heck of a lot that we don't know about Ostertagia in cattle, at least in beef cattle, um, which might seem strange since uh, the books are full of the stuff. But um, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it relates to dairy farming, and a lot of it re uh, relates to 
small holdings in the Northern Hemisphere, which doesn't quite fit the picture that we have here. Okay, so let's briefly talk about our species. In cattle, it's Ostertagia ostertagii, uh, brown stomach worm, small brown stomach worm, or medium brown stomach worm. In sheep and goats, um, they're, well, for parasitologists, there are these people that give them names um, and the uh, people that are responsible for the nomenclature suffer from relevance deprivation syndrome. So every so often they throw a spanner in the works and they change the genus. And in this case, um, it used to be Ostertagia circumcincta, but it's now, or it has been for quite some years, Tila dorsagia. Let's not get too hung up about the names because uh, they're very, very closely related, even if they are in different genus. Goats are also afflicted mostly with uh, Tela dorsagis circumcincta. So that means, in fact, that sheep and goats can share worms, uh, or specifically brown stomach worm, with, uh, with gay abandon. Occasionally, very occasionally, we do know that goats can also um, reproduce uh, Ostertagia or Ostertagii. Whether this is of any real importance is problematic, but probably not. So it might almost be an accidental finding rather than something to get a hot under the collar about. So uh, for those of you like looking down the, um, the microscope, there is the front end, the head end of an Ostertagia. There's the rear end of the same worm. Uh, I think, uh, Fiona, we better offer a prize to the person who can identify that as a male or a female, and Matt doesn't count. And for those of you that do your own egg counts or uh, really spend a lot of time looking down the microscope, that's the good old fashioned Ostertagia egg, which to all intents and purposes is indistinguishable from the other strongolytic eggs. Um, whether it be sort of barber's pole or uh, caperia or uh, black scow worm. So um, those of you that do your own egg counts would know that the only egg that is readily distinguishable uh, is that of Nematodorus because it's twice the size. So here's uh, a schematic of the uh, life cycle of both Ostertagia and the sheep version, which is Tila dorsagia. Um, Adult worms uh, in the beast, you can change for a sheep, for a cow, if you so wish. Um, eggs are passed out in the feces. Um, they undergo at least uh, two or three uh, larval stages on the pasture. The thing I'd like to point out is the ability for the, the third stage larvae to live for very long periods um, on the pasture under the right conditions. So uh, this is where you can have accumulation of um, infective stages on the pasture. And we'll come back to what those right conditions uh, might be. But when those conditions prevail, the larvae become active, they climb up the grass, they're ingested. Um, in the, the case of both sheep and cattle, they do enter the abomasum of the, um, uh, the lining of the abomasum, the lining of the fourth stomach, and there they mature to adult worms and they pop out. So for those that anatomically inclined, the gastric stomach or the fourth stomach is where all species of Ostertagia live, as opposed to most of the other scowl worms, which are not uh, exclusively, but mostly in the small intestine. So we've talked about larval availability. And pretty much Australia-wide, the larvae of Ostertagia start to accumulate on the pasture when the weather cools and uh, moisture becomes more readily available. So um, here we've got two curves, this one for uh, Western Australia and this one for Victoria. I'm sure the Western Australians will be upset by the fact that uh, they're in the dotted line. And really the only difference is, um, you know, how early in the season they start to accumulate. If we were to do one for a summer rainfall area like the New England, I'm sure in fact that the peak would be a little bit further to the right still. But what it shows is that uh, it's the cool moisture conditions that allow the larvae to contribute. And that's what makes Ostertagia, not universally, but mostly a winter dominant species, even if they uh, actually sort of hit the livestock at slightly different stages.
the availability curves are roughly the same for both sheep and cattle, um, at least until you get uh, well up north uh, into the New England, where it's, as we've said, it's going to be even further to the right. Uh, and the coastal areas in New South Wales, where Ostatagia is still a problem in cattle, might even be a little bit further uh, to the right still. The thing to keep in mind, in fact, is that uh, in places like the New England and the coastal areas, it's quite possible that you're also dealing with other species of worms, which are actually more important, most notably um, uh, homonchus or barbus pole, which is not a scow worm, but uh, can cut a path of destruction in both sheep and cattle. One of the things that comes out of this is that depending on when you carve and wean, um, there is an opportunity for larval pickup in cattle, which um, can impact them severely. So it's a theme that we're going to be returning to time and again, but um, mostly for the summer autumn carvers uh, who will be weaning sort of mid to late spring as a generalization, their calves may well be affected with uh, ostatagia right from the get go. So from before weaning, uh, until well after weaning. Whereas um, godly people who are winter spring carvers and wean in the following autumn, in the high rainfall areas at least, the initial infection tends to be with uh, cuperia, which is uh, at least in this part of the world, a much less pathogenic species. But um, there's any amount of opportunity for those same animals to pick up uh, quite significant burdens of ostatagia and come down with uh, ostatagias or, or at least have uh, reduced productivity in the following spring as they approach one year of age. And again, that's a theme we'll return to time and again. Okay, um, so this is a graphic that I did for a Parabos workshop that we ran down here in Tasmania for sheep uh, quite some years ago now. Uh, and I'm very proud of it because, in fact, I know that one of the um, one of the pharmaceutical companies purloined it and put it up on their website. Um, unfortunately, it's probably not right. Um, so it it's a graphic of where the worms actually cut their path of destruction. And for brown stomach worm here uh, in Tasmania and the southern part of Victoria, and in fact in the the, tab the southern tablelands of New South Wales in wetter years. The situation is not so much that we don't uh, that we get a break in ostatagia over the winter months. We've said that's when the, the, the larvae are most available and the infections tend to accumulate. It's just that at that time of the year, black scow worm kind of subsumes everything else. And um, even if there are ostatagia there, it's this species here that we're particularly worried about. Um, so if uh, you are in the Mediterranean climate uh, in Western Australia, uh, you can join those two sides together and you might get a little bit more of a break over the, uh, the summer period when it goes as dry as chips. Cattle on the whole do not develop good immunity until two years of age. So that means in fact that you, uh, you have to uh, parent them well into their adulthood to keep the worms at bay. Um, so uh, as we've already said for autumn carvers, that means they could well be parasitized at weaning. Um, oh, there's a mistake. Matt, you missed that one. Um, no, 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 I'm sorry, that's right. Uh, autumn carvers are also more likely to develop what we call the type two ostatagia, which we're going to come back to in a moment. Um, for sheep and goats, they are often developing good immunity at 12 to 18 months of age, but they need the presence of the worms to actually develop that immunity. So uh, in this part of the world where we're starting to see uh, worm burdens in the spring in one year old sheep, we often let them run out a little bit in the hope that they'll develop that immunity rather than keeping them totally suppressed. The bad news for our goat listeners is that uh, goats, particularly what I might classify as desert goats, rarely, if ever, develop a workable immunity in comparison with either sheep or for that matter, even dairy goats. So under the right conditions, um, desert type goats are always going to be vulnerable to parasitism and ostatagia is a big part, is a big part of that. But as we've said, 
for both sheep and goats, if Ostertagia is your main scour species, then it usually means that you're in a climate that allows good strategic control. And we'll come back to that. Okay, so when you go onto the uh, Worm Boss website for sheep and uh, goats, you can find this graphic. And um, it doesn't actually tell you where the Ostertagia are. It's more an administrative sort of map, but I thought I'd use it anyway. So if we take out these areas here, maybe if we could go a little bit further north in, in, um, in uh, Victoria, they're pretty much free of every worms except in very good seasons. We can find Ostertagia in sheep, cattle and goats in all of these other areas almost every year. So that's, um, that's a pretty big uh, slice of the livestock producing country. Sheep, obviously there's not so many sheep on the coast once we get north of um, sort of uh, central north New South Wales, but on the coast, well up into um, Queensland, uh, there's certainly Ostertagia present in the cattle herd as well. And in fact, uh, Matt Playford just told me before we came on air that um, they had had some samples sent into his lab from uh, not very far from Townsville and they had uh, decent populations of Ostertagia in them. Right, so when we start talking about disease and production losses, all of the storybooks seem to focus on the disease. So, you know, they're talking about animals that are obviously parasitized whose life might be in peril. So we'll just briefly address that first. The first type is what we call type one disease, and that's the classic scouring and ill thrift. Um, it's most likely in autumn herds uh, soon after weaning. Um, it can occur in uh, spring calving herds at weaning, but less frequently. And also that's generally part of a mixed infection. So to return to the uh, graphic that we had right at the start, that's classic type one Ostertagia. And uh, this photo is from the LLS in New South Wales. And that happens to be an autumn calving herd. And those animals, I don't know how long they've been weaned, but they're hardly thriving, are they? And that's exactly what you see with type one Ostertagia. Now, Type two disease is one of those things for which you get a high distinction in the vet exam. Um, and I've got to say, I don't fully understand it and I'm not sure that there is anybody that does, but it occurs classically when uh, larvae are picked up in 18 month old cattle. They uh, go in as um, larvae into the wall of the abomasum and then they just lie there, not causing any issues, but under some circumstances, there is a synchronous emergence of those larvae in the following uh, autumn when those animals are approaching two years of age. And this is potentially a life-threatening condition. So they get diabolical uh, bottle jaw, uh, I'm sorry, diabolical diarrhea. They can have bottle jaw and sometimes the mortality can be quite high. So it's mostly an issue of autumn calving heifers. Um, it can occur after other stresses, most notably uh, transport. The thing about it is that the occurrence is sporadic. So um, there are areas where it seems to occur most years. For example, the central tablelands of New South Wales is one of the well-identified areas. Um, other areas that are heavily autumn carving biased, just never see it. Theories of causation, well, um, we don't know what causes them to, to stop maturing, nor do we know what causes the uh, synchronous release from the gut. A whole host of theories, including different populations of worms to um, uh, the dynamics of the worms in the abomasum itself. Um, and then, you know, some feedback loop uh, where the worms can actually sense that it's a good time to come out and cause havoc. We diagnose it uh, 
with a blood sample by looking at um, pepsinogen in the blood. And for those of you that are keen to look down the, the microscope, you can also find the larvae in the feces. And um, that's actually quite exciting when you uh, have little wigglers in your, in your feces instead of just uh, worm eggs. Okay, so that is the classic um, type 2 Ostertagia. This animal um, is not a heifer. I think you can see it's a steer, uh, profuse diarrhea, it's damn near dead, and the protein loss from the damage to the abomasal wall has caused this classic bottle jaw, which we tend to usually see with uh, Barber's pole rather than with, with Ostertagia. That's a picture from the Parabice website showing the damage that's been done to the, the wall of the, um, the abomasum. Now, the classic description is Moroccan leather, but because um, I went through the public school system, we only ever had sort of plastic wallets rather than Moroccan leather ones. So you'll have to use your imagination with that. Um, and again, for those of you that get excited by uh, microscopic pictures, this is the, uh, the lining of the abomasum, the fourth stomach or the gastric stomach. And there's the little larvae sitting in there and they come out all at once. Okay, so let's now talk about what in reality for cattle um, is the more important issue and that is production losses. And the interesting thing is that here in Australia, there's actually a paucity of good trial information on what happens with Ostertagia alone. There are some trials and some experiments on, on um, mixed infections and also um, any amount of information for dairy cattle, but a good old standalone Ostertagia, a yeah, bit of a hole in the information there. So uh, an MLA trial um, done, published 2020, these are feedlot animals going into the, um, going into the feedlot. Those that had were parasitized, presumably with mixed infections, grew at roughly 5% slower than animals that were treated on entry into the feedlot. And you can follow that up to your own satisfaction. What I find more interesting, in fact, is the IJA, which stands for the International Journal of Anecdote, damn near every year that I've been in Tasmania now. Um, and uh, clients report that if they are not under the protection of um, a drenching regime during the springtime, that their growth rates are slowed by between five and 10%. Now, some years ago, I had uh, was privy to get access to information out of what was essentially a very large grass feedlot in Victoria. Um, and uh, they were always sending off animals to be slaughtered and therefore they're always going over the scales. And uh, once um, long acting mectin suppressive treatments ran out, there was little doubt that their, their growth rates slowed pretty much overnight between five and 10%. So there is absolutely no doubt that you can justify the cost of uh, suppressive treatment, particularly in rapidly growing animals um, and you're gonna make a return on it. So if you've got a 400 kilo uh, animal that's growing uh, or has 150 grams to 200 grams knocked off its growth rate, that's going to be huge by the end of its growing period. Uh, you know, in, in the region of 50 or 60 kilos difference uh, if the parasitism is uh, at best poorly controlled. Um, And that's led to the situation where dedicated cattle finishers have been very happy to relentlessly suppress their worm burdens in the spring. And you know, again, south of the ranges and in Tasmania and southeast of South Australia, uh, those uh, guys are nearly always dealing uh, with Ostertagia rather than other species at that time. If you go for the relentlessly suppressive approach, you're going to uh, sooner or later run into big issues with resistance, and this is just not sustainable. Sheep and goats, um, there's no doubt that, that even as a standalone species, they can cut a path of destruction if they're poorly controlled, particularly in goats. But 
Uh, bear in mind that they're usually part of a bigger syndrome and they're not as uh, pathogenic as uh, the black scow worm, particularly um, in uh, uniform rainfall areas and under irrigation, which is an increasing issue here in Tasmania. Um, in the Mediterranean zone, so uh, sort of the um, areas north of um, Adelaide in South Australia, and north of the ranges in Victoria and pretty much all of Western Australia, except for that uh, very much southwestern corner, they can be the standalone um, scour demon, if you like. And it uh, is often the only species present to any great extent uh, in late spring and into the, uh, into the summer. And they're particularly destructive of young stock. Adult stock, or at least adult sheep, become quite resistant to them. So uh, in those true Mediterranean climates, because the pasture basically goes back to bare boards, it gives you a circuit breaker to allow you to use environmental control along with, um, with strategic drenching to keep a lid on things. The downside of such good control is in fact that it can play merry hell with your resistance status. So uh, it's not, a, not an all or nothing thing. Uh, whereas, say, here in Tasmania, uh, we get very, very poor control from our strategic drenches, but our drench resistance status is way better, as it is in New Zealand, by the way. So I would exhort you all to go to uh, wormboss.com.au and follow your regional guides. That's a really good starting point. So coming back to the map that we showed before... The Mediterranean zone, sort of here in Western Australia, except for this very much the southeast corner. Um, South Australia, again, except for the southeast corner. And north of the range here in Victoria, up into New South Wales, you can get good strategic control. South of the range in Victoria, Gippsland, uh, Tasmania, and um, sometimes the Tablelands, uh, New South Wales, um, you're going to be dealing with other species as well. And once you get to unimportant places like Armadale, then uh, in fact, your chief concern is always going to be Barbus Pole in the summer. And for those of you that are not familiar with worm boss, I hope you all are, that's the sort of thing you, you are confronted with when you go into follow the regional guides. Okay, so let's move on to treatments. It's no great surprise that clinically wormy animals need to be treated. Uh, and if they're not, then it becomes uh, both an animal welfare and an animal health issue. Motherhood statement. Having said that, the vast majority of drenching is to maximise productivity. And that's particularly the case in finishing cattle. Um, but, you know, the finishing period basically starts as soon as they're weaned. So if you miss the hurdle there in an autumn calving herd, then you can be a long way behind the eight ball. Um, and as we've already said, the tendency for really highly suppressive drenching is creating resistance problem. Those animals need to be treated. Animals like that need to be treated. Big surprise. So, <clears throat> Here's the balancing act. We want to get the animals looking like this without ruining all drenches. So on the cattle uh, worm boss website, this is one of several that has been put up, uh, drenching programs has been put up for uh, a spring calving herd, um, which for example is um, large parts of the Tablelands, uh, most of Tasmania, and some parts of Victoria as well, uh, except the benighted souls who insist on autumn calving. Um, so the, the ticks are, are, if you like, strategic drenches nearly every year. And uh, the ones in the parentheses are uh, therapeutic drenches or sometimes some years. Um, I didn't write this, but uh, it's pretty much stock standard for what we recommend uh, to our clients. So um, whoever did it, uh, congratulations, you at least got one fan. So 
The thing about the spring calving herds is that when they're weaned in the March, May period, our chief species is Cuperia, um, or spe specifically Cuperia oncophora. Now they're nowhere near as nasty as Ostatagia. And so we're fairly happy to let them not run, but not, uh, you know, sort of we, we don't implement suppressive treatments. So the stock standard recommendation would be a short acting drench at, uh, at weaning. And then uh, if you're going to use a long acting suppressive type drench, which nearly all nectin based, then in fact, uh, we'd leave that until the spring. When we use a long acting drench, um, now I know the term's relative, we don't have long acting to the same extent as they do in the sheep world, but uh, I'm going to suggest that we probably should be using a primer. So we should be taking out the worms that are already uh, in those animals at the time that we give the, uh, the long acting or longer acting drench, regardless of what version it comes in. And as far as possible at nearly every drench, including the, the, the primer, we probably should be using multi-actives. And we're gonna come back to that. I'm going to go out on a bit of a limb here and say, as far as you can, avoid the use of long acting mectins repeatedly in the course of one season. And that's basically just to take the pressure off those, those formulations. So uh, in late spring, many producers have uh, the opportunity to integrate a little bit of uh, IPM, so integrated pest management. So start looking at trying to use regrowing hay paddocks and or new sowings and or fodder crops, uh, rather than just giving them another drench and whacking them back on the existing perennial pastures. The alternative is to try and get right away from the mectins um, with uh, an alternative, uh, maybe even something as old fashioned as a benzimidazole, which have pretty much dropped out of use for cattle these days. If we go on to more <laughs> autumn calving herds, they, the program doesn't look uh, radically different to what we had for the spring calving herd, but I guess I'd highlight a couple of things. You can expect to have Ostertagia at this time of the year um, in your autumn calving herds in the, uh, the newly weaned calves. And depending on how green it is, that may follow them all the way through until um, May, June. The, the other thing is that um, in this, the autumn calving herds, because of the possibility of type two Ostertagiasis, it might be necessary to give them a drench at this time here to knock out those inhibited larvae. Outside of that, there's not a whole lot of difference between the two, uh, the two uh, programs, is there? And for both of them, you can say that on the whole, adult cattle don't need a whole lot of treatment. Okay, so we're reinventing the wheel uh, then, but um, calves are going to be vulnerable to Ostertagia right from the get-go, so be aware of that. Um, and it's not as if it only hits them when they're weaned, they can still be hit the following spring too, because they're, they're still uh, less than that critical two years of age. We've already said that the first carvers are vulnerable to the type two Ostertagia. I guess my best advice there is to use local experience to assess the risk because it doesn't occur in all areas and not all years. So, uh, yep, take local uh, uh, advice as much as you can. I'm sure you are already. Um, so here in Tasmania, um, we would usually give um, an early winter drench to first carvers, but nothing else. So that's probably a less intensive drenching program than uh, is put up on, on Parabos. Second carvers rarely need a drench even less so for adult cattle. Oh dear, oh dear, there's a spelling mistake I should have taken out. But having said all that, be aware of the conditions where cattle are going to be taking worm burdens into the winter or uh, particularly vulnerable to worm burdens that they may pick up. 
if the cattle are already lactating, then winter can be absolute crunch time because the, the nutritional drain caused by lactation plus a few worms can send them to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and for the spring carvers, uh, we rely on the spring to actually give them body condition before they join. But if they go into the winter in this condition here, this was taken at preg testing maybe four or five years ago, condition score one and a half, this animal is going to be uh, on a knife's edge regardless of what we do, but without drenching, it could be in diabolical trouble. Okay. So cognizant of the fact that so many of our listeners today are sheep people, I don't wish to gloss over this, but um, there's such enormous variation between uh, location, enterprise, uh, particularly if you've got irrigation or you're using that, um, whether you're a trader or a breeder, you've got to make reliance on the uh, drench decision guides. In particular, know the number and the timing of the strategic drenches. So uh, we've already made mention of the fact that the strategic drenches place very heavy selection pressure on uh, worms for resistance in the Mediterranean zones. That's because if you use the old double summer drench program, then uh, in fact, at the time of the second summer drench, there's almost no worms on the pasture and the whole of the worm population is being exposed to the drench. Here in Tasmania and south of the ranges in, in uh, Victoria, uh, we have the opposite problem. And that is that our strategic trenches rarely if ever uh, work brilliantly because there's always so much uh, residual contamination on the pasture. So whether you give one or two and their timing uh, is going to be highly area and enterprise contingent. But uh, all of that information is spelled out in great detail uh, on the Worm Boss website or consult your local guru. The second point is that you're flying blind unless you've got current uh, drench efficacy data. So we know that Ostertagia, um, it's almost certain that they're going to be resistant to the mectins and probably have some level of resistance to everything else as well. Um, when this was last reviewed, I think there was something less than about 14 or 15% of sheep producers Australia-wide had current drench efficacy data, which is absolutely lamentable. I mean, even given that at least a portion of the sheep population runs where there are no worms, um, why it's not around the 80 or 90% um, level for efficacy data in the high rainfall areas, at least, I don't know. But anyway, it's something that seems to have fallen off the radar altogether. Um, I'd also urge that the vast majority of therapeutic drenches, so non-strategic drenches, be based on um, very close monitoring if the stock are less than one year of age. So rather than uh, drenching every six weeks or alternatively, uh, you know, deciding that they look wormy or smell wormy, start building up a data bank on, uh, of egg counts. And uh, once you get good at it, you will start predicting the situation um, well in advance of when they're likely to have uh, worm burdens and you can monitor to check that. But the other thing is that it gives you really good information on how much contamination is going down onto the pastures. And so you can make uh, decisions about um, what level of threat animals might face during the winter and spring. The parasitology community has been talking about integrated pest management since I was a kitty. Um, and believe me, that's long before Leonard Teal left homicide and probably before most of you were born. Unfortunately, it is something that we know all about and rarely if ever practice. But as our drenches run out, if we don't start doing something uh, to integrate grazing management with, with um, our drenching, then we're going to be in a whole world of pain. And speaking of whole worlds of pain, we'll move on to goats. And goats have uh, raised the bar to another level. So goats metabolize nearly all drenches very quickly. So they require a different dosing regime. Um, they have 
the most extraordinary capacity to promote resistance. So there's a well retold story about Solvix um, when um, it was being developed. The, uh, the company that uh, developed it said that they had passaged um, different worms in the laboratory many, many times and they hadn't been able to produce resistance. And so they launched it confident, in fact, that uh, it would never become resistant. Well, some bright spark in New Zealand put it into his goats and uh, resistance was uh, present in that worm population within six months. Additionally, we don't have many registered products for goats. And so actually using them uh, may be subject to uh, different state legislations. Um, and of course, the final point, which we've already covered, is that goats have little resistance in comparison with sheep and cattle, particularly what you know, I'd call the desert goat species, which are not inherently resistant in any way, shape or form. So our motherhood statements for these guys, you've got to use IPM. And the biggest part of using IPM, apart from uh, you know, strategic drenching, is providing browse. Um, I'm sure that the reason that our forebears brought gorse into the country was to stop goats dying from worms. So if you've got gorse or uh, other species like that that need control, put your goats out there. Like sheep, you've got to know the resistance status. If you don't, you're flying blind. Um, there are a couple of uh, left field alternatives uh, for, for, um, for um, Barber's pole. We have the vaccine, which can obviously be also used in sheep. But uh, for smaller herds of goats, there's a product uh, on the market called Biowormer, which is a fungus which actually eats the, uh, eats the uh, worm eggs on the, on the pasture. So, you know, uh, for small numbers of animals, that's quite a possibility. Okay, now we probably shouldn't be uh, advertising on this forum, but uh, there's really only one ABC, despite what Rupert Murdoch might say, and there's really only one Dr. Sandra Bluxendall, who is the goat guru in Australia. Uh, that's her contact there, so consult with her and uh, she can give you a lot more than I ever could. Um, and she also has contributed a lot to um, Worm Boss for Goats. How are we going for time? Oh yeah, better hurry up. Right, so resistance, it's the big issue that's confronting the sheep industry and it's starting to confront the, goat, the uh, cattle industry as well. So the constant use of um, ML porons has probably contributed to high levels of resistance in uh, Cuperia and it's starting to appear in Ostatagia as well. The drug profiles of the porons favor the development of resistance. I don't think there's much doubt about that. Um, so we need to start looking again at uh, orals and injectables, uh, albeit that they're nowhere near as convenient. We should be using primers for sustained action drugs. Um, and to slow the resistance, um, we need to know our status. You need to use multi-actives more and more. We're gonna come back to that in a moment. Um, use IPM to help decontamination and every so often say, okay, it might be a week slower until we get these animals off, but we're not gonna re-drench them. So this lovely graphic is courtesy of Matt Playford. Um, and that's uh, pretty much the uh, current um, information for, um, for uh, drench groups Australia-wide. A couple of highlights, um, Ostatagia, ML porons probably starting to fail, whereas the ML injectables are still going reasonably well. And that goes to the nature of, or the, the, if you like, the drug curve of the two different presentations. Um, we can't rely on uh, levamazole, porons. Um, levamazole oral and VZ orals tend to be fairly good. Uh, and a combination oral drenches are absolutely superb. Cuperia, this one here, which here in the south is not particularly pathogenic, but um, uh, the northern species do tend to be more pathogenic. So um, it's a uh, situation with particularly ML porons, not necessarily brilliant. 
And just very brief comment about this, that the registered pers persistence activity for the different ones that have persistent activity, um, the, the poron versions are more likely to fall short than the injectable version. Whoops, there, yeah, we'll go back. Okay, so this graphic shows us why we should be using multi-actives. If we start with all of them working reasonably well, and by all of them, I mean sort of a white drench, a clear drench and a mectin, combined in a, um, a three-way combination, this curve here shows you the rate at which development, uh, resistance develops, as opposed to a single active, and it doesn't really matter what active that is, it's probably going to be buggered within 10 years. So, uh, Multi-actives are pretty much the standard in, in um, the sheep industry now. It's time they came to the cattle industry. Again, courtesy of Matt Playford, um, what we've got to realise, in fact, is that the head bale serves another purpose apart from ear tagging. Um, and we need to get uh, used to the idea of oral drenches and particularly combination oral drenches. At this stage of the game, uh, injectables seem to be holding up fairly well, at least the injectable mectins do. The backliners, be they ever so convenient um, and huge amounts of money being spent here in Tasmania on uh, flash new cattle yards with uh, side rails up the race to make this job even easier still but uh, we might be backing ourselves into a, a blind corner. Finally, pasture decontamination. Now this is a, uh, a subject that is dear to the hearts of just about all parasitologists. All we can say is that we know a huge amount about it and nothing's ever done about it. So just some things to, to think about. The best worm control I've ever seen is somebody on Flinders Island who has actually partitioned his farm. Oh, well, in fact, they're, they're really neighbouring farms. So um, six months for sheep and cattle. Uh, so, I'm sorry, six months for sheep, six months for cattle, and then he swaps. Doesn't drench in what must be the, worms, uh, the worm centre of Australia. Sequential grazing. So uh, sheep followed by cattle. Um, this is going to follow, this is going to aid the cattle no end, particularly if you can graze the sheep uh, on spring pastures in advance of weaning uh, late in the spring. But because uh, it's, if, if it's going to be done, it's usually the other way around. And so in fact, uh, for some of our uh, irrigation producers, we've got them making sure that cattle stay under the irrigators during the spring. Circuit breakers, um, hay and silage making, heavens to Betsy, there's hardly a, uh, cattle producer in the in the high rainfall area that doesn't make hay or silage. So use those paddocks to do away with drenching as they regrow. Cropping and pasture renovation, um, really important, even with sort of minimum pasture tillage, you get uh, a very great, uh, very good low worm status, particularly um, if it's occurring during the spring. And you need to protect those new sowings by making sure that whatever you've got gets drenched onto them. They'll stay clean for some time. Okay. Um, major worm species of cattle, they can present as two syndromes as we've discussed. They're part of a scour worm complex for sheep and goats, but um, in the Mediterranean zone, at least we can uh, control them quite well environmentally but they can be destructive in the right circumstances. We've got to move our control away from reliance solely on drenching and particularly drenching using our MLs. So use multi-actives where possible, know your resistance status and start using some IPM, please. So whether this counts as integrated Parasite control, I'm not quite sure. This is somewhere in far north Queensland, as a matter of fact. Everybody looks happy, and that's enough from me. Thanks, Paul. Great presentation. I will just get my webcam up.
So not too late to type your questions in, everybody. I have a couple sitting in the question pane already. And don't forget, if you have any webinar topic suggestions, Megan's sitting on the chat at the moment, ready and waiting to take on your topics. We are planning the rest of the year's run of webinars at the moment for Parabos, which we aim to deliver monthly. So it would be great to have your feedback through on what's causing problems in your area. So to the question pane now. Um, first question is, what is WFAP? It was an acronym, Paul, that you used when w you were talking uh, about orphan uh, carving. A ASAP. Well, AS, as far as possible, it should have been. Okay. AFAP. AFAP, as far as possible. Okay. That was a technical question. <laughs> Okay, this is a question that came through. Can sheep have the same synchronised emergence of worms and has it ever been recorded? Not that I'm aware. Uh, so we don't recognise it as um, either a phenomenon or, um, if you like, uh, a clinical issue. There can be um, inhibition of Barber's pole um, in the, in the uh, abomasum. And that actually uh, contributes at least to some extent to the epidemiology of Barber's pole in, in, um, in some areas. But um, the damage is done uh, by the Barber's pole rather than the emergence. Whereas with, with the Ostertagia in cattle, uh, the fact or the damage done by the emergence from the, the gut wall is what causes the damage. So long answer, short is not an issue in sheep or goats that I know of. Thanks, Paul. Can we breed resistance to the multi-actives in one hit or do the modes of action mean this should be impossible? Well, it's not impossible, but it slows it mightily. So it's contingent on the uh, all of the actives being... Um, at least, you know, reasonably well, uh, reasonably active, and by that we can say greater than about 75% active um, at the time that you start using them together, and then you get very good cross protection. Um, so if you, um, if you've got X number of generations for uh, any given active, <clears throat> if you use them sequentially, then if they're roughly the same, then obviously that uh, all drenches will be buggered in three X generations. Whereas if they are cross protecting each other, then that extends the period in which the drenches work um, much, much longer. The, the, the trouble is in fact that most of us are starting from a position where one or more of the, the actives are already way, way down. And so you're, you're, in effect, relying on two actives to cross protect each other. Um, and in some cases, you've got one that's working reasonably well, and the other two are tailed right off, and they're just providing a tiny amount of additional support to the one that's working well. Um, and in that situation, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't take long for resistance to develop. Thanks, Paul. Um, I have another question coming through and Matt, feel free to chip in. This is probably a question um, directed straight to you. If you suspect a worm problem with a few cattle in your herd, how do you take a sample for egg count purposes? Do you take a sample from only the problem cattle or take a sample from the whole herd? Yeah, great question. There is a, um, there is a page on the Worm Boss for Cattle a web page that does explain about um, worm egg counts. So that's probably the first place to go. For um, our clients at the Dorbets Lab, we put up a, a, a little video on YouTube. So um, I, can, um, I can endorse that as well. So you go to YouTube and then you just type in Dorbets cattle sampling and that'll take you to a little video how to, how to collect samples. And um, there is one other place, and that's on Zoetis Livestock Solutions. I know there's a video there as well if you prefer videos. 
Thanks, oh, Mark. And then the, the other part of that question, do you take a sample only from the problem cattle or, or from the whole herd? Definitely get both because you want to know not only if um, the worms are causing disease, but there is often subclinical disease as well, which is disease that doesn't show any signs, um, no visible signs in the cattle, but it's suppressing their, um, their growth rates. And so you want to get um, some samples from the, uh, the rest of the herd and some from the cattle that have got the, the, the signs of worms, which may be you know, a stained back end or uh, diarrhea or not doing well. Thanks, Matt. Uh, next question, when grazing with sheep and cattle, rotationally grazing this is, do paddocks still need traditional long rest periods to reduce parasite loads? And what would best, what would be the best practice, grazing with sheep first, grazing with cattle first, or grazing them both together? Wow. Let's deal with the last part first. Um, it would be better to always have either the sheep going first or the cattle going first, um, rather than having them co-grazing. When they're co-grazing, any parasite uh, effect is basically dilution and stocking rate rather than decontamination. So which goes first, the sheep or the cattle, is more frequently an agronomic question, uh, by which I mean, in fact, that um, the... Uh, the reason that you would have your sheep, I'm sorry, your cattle going first in most situations is because their productivity is going to be limited at much higher residues than the sheep. So classically, uh, particularly under irrigation, they would have the cattle going first uh, and they might graze that down to, for argument's sake, 1200 kilos um, per hectare. Uh, and then at that stage, uh, the the pasture becomes limiting for um, the cattle and so the sheep come in behind it and they can graze it. Uh, even growing lambs can graze it much lower without, without any ill effects on their growth rate. In terms of um, decontamination of paddocks, I, I think the thing to keep in mind is that decontamination occurs because you have um, a species that is grazing that paddock and picking up worms and not recycling them and or spelling. So in effect, it's, a, it's the duration of the spelling. So to get really good pasture decontamination, depending on the time of the year, um, you're probably going to need sort of continuous grazing with um, another species. So sheep before cattle or cattle before sheep for something in the region of four to six months. As you come, and that's particularly in, say in the case of Ostertagia over the, um, over the winter time, basically nothing kills the larvae uh, except old age. When they move into the spring, um, there's a whole host of things happen, but uh, not the least of which is the fact that you get a dilution effect from the pasture and uh, from the pasture growth. And you also have the fact that the, inhib the larvae that have been lying dormant on the pasture all of a sudden become active and look, look for a sheep or a cow to infect. And then they die off because their energy reserves are used up. So in the spring going into the summer, that period may come down to, for argument's sake, three months. And then over the summer, depending on where you are, if you've got no ground cover, then nothing survives anyway. So if you're concern is only for worms, then you've got to look at rotations that might be somewhere in the region of um, six months over the, over the winter period. If you're trying to sort of do a little bit of everything and that is make good use of pasture and also um, uh, make sure that the, the growing classes of livestock are adequately fed, then over the springtime, if you can actually have the alternative species on critical paddocks for as short as three months, that might make a big difference. And we're starting to use that sort of thing in, in uh, irrigation circles here in Tasmania. Fundamentally, with the exception of Barber's Pole, which is a bit of a, uh, a different story, most of the scour worms are not, and I'm not saying that Barber's Pole is a scour worm, but most of the scour worms, rotational grazing makes very little difference to, to the effect that it has on worms because the rotation Duration is way too short. 
Thanks, Paul. Anything to add there, Matt? No, that's very comprehensive. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next question, how do I rotate my drenches if I'm giving a triple? <laughs> you or me, Matt? Uh, well, I'm happy to take that one. If you're using a triple at the moment, most triples have, have got levamazole, which is a clear drench, a BZ, which is a white drench, and then either abamectin or tridectin, uh, or sorry, moxidectin uh, in them as well. And um, of course, they're the three traditional um, drench groups. To rotate them, you'd go to Zolvix, which is the orange colored drench, and it's one of the new ones called Monipantel. So that starts with a Z, Zolvix. Or you'd go to StarTech, which again contains one of the new active ingredients, which is the Quantel. Now both Zolvix and um, StarTech are available with abamectin in them, or the StarTech is only available with abamectin in the formulation, which again gives you another dose of the, of the ML or the, the mectin. So yes, you, um, you rotate your drenches by moving to one of the uh, new drenches. And then for um, Barber's Pole Worm, you also have some options with Barber's Pole specific drenches. And again, I'd encourage you to go to the Worm Boss website, which has a, a list of all the drenches and, uh, and what types of worms they kill. Thanks, Matt. Brings us to our last question. If anyone has any last minute questions, I will check them after we have a look here. Oh, another one's just popped through. Are we likely to see multi-actives with a mectin in them? Without, sorry, without a mectin in them. Um, well, we have got um, dual actives without a mectin in them. So you're probably already using one, Emily, or you're aware of um, the duo care or the uh, levamazole plus BZ um, combinations. And they're, um, you know, they've, they've been around for 20 years or more and um, have been used by a lot of people. Uh, apart from that, no, it's, a, it's a, a waiting game to see what the pharmaceutical companies come out with. Thanks, Matt. Um, last question for you, Paul, to start with. Matt and I talk about this quite often, the movement of homonchus throughout the different areas and increasing in prevalence through the different mm. states. Um, do, do we see the same in black scalworm lately? Mm. Um, I guess my, from my perspective, not to the same extent with Barber's Pole. So... Um, here in Tassie, Barber's Pole was basically uh, almost a threatened species, uh, except for Flinders Island and occasionally the Tamer Valley. But um, the combination of irrigation plus changes to the way the enterprises are run means that uh, Barber's Pole is spreading um, far and wide with quite destructive effects. It seems as if uh, trikes are, um, you know, in most areas where trikes are known to be here for the long haul, uh, we see them every year in other parts of Australia, for example, uh, up and down the Tablelands. The effect that they have is going to be seasonally contingent. Um, in other parts of Australia, most notably the Mediterranean zone, they rarely, if ever, get a go on. And if they do, they disappear again indefinitely. Um, so be the fact that we are creating uh, new environments for uh, Barber's Pole means that it is genuinely spreading as opposed to, in my opinion, trikes which come and go uh, with greater or lesser severity depending on uh, what happens with individual seasons. Yeah, Thanks, sorry, Matt's sorry up, Fiona. Yeah. I thought I'd, I'd better just um, add that, yes, we're seeing um, the Moncus Barber's pole worm from all over Victoria now, which we, we haven't seen in previous years. So spreading, whether it's seasonal or whether it's going to remain, really does depend on the situation um, with, with uh, as Paul mentioned, with both rainfall irrigation and other circumstances. And I just have to return to Venetia's question, which was about um, using a triple in cattle and then um, rotating. Um, Monty Pantle is registered for cattle now, so you can actually use that on label. And um, 
thank you for clarifying that point. StarTech is definitely not registered for cattle or for goats. So it's only registered for sheep. But Moni Pantel is registered for cattle. If you have a look at um, uh, the, the Pub Chris website, that will give you all of the details about that. Thanks, Matt. And thank you, Megan, for running our chat box there in the background. Um, and everybody for asking questions today and um, joining in the Q&A session. And it was great to have Matt on. We might have to bring Matt in for all our Q&A panels, I think, because it's um, always good to have multiple people on. We're a bit spoilt here with so many great people. So uh, just a couple of slides from me before we finish up. I'll send out a follow-up survey tomorrow and you will be able to um, answer this through the email that I send you, but there will also be a link posted in the chat box, hopefully today. There's only five short questions, so I thank you in advance for filling it in and giving us your feedback. It won't take you too long and we really enjoy your responses. And... Um, Paul touched on it before, so goats are a bit of a challenge. We're very well aware of that. So our next webinar, Save the Date to All Goat Producers and um, Goat Advisors, we'll be doing Managing Worms in Goats, and it'll be an interactive webinar, this one with a Q&A session afterwards. So we're hoping to run it through till about 2.30. It'll be a little bit longer than our normal webinars on the 17th of May at 1 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And... I'm going to save who the presenters are going to be at the moment because we're hoping to get a couple of presenters but maybe even a panel. So watch this space and we'll just um, see who we can wrangle in. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Thanks, Matt, for joining us for Question Time, Paul, for the great presentation, and Megan for helping in the background. So that's all for us today from Parabos. Um, it was great to have you on board and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Bye, everyone.